And today we have one of the most amazing panels I've seen, and I know several of the panelists here. Um, so we're going to start uh, introducing by order, like from, from here, from left to right. Um, so first we have Professor Kjeld Hansen. Uh, Kjeld, do you mind just introducing yourself a little bit? Yeah, uh, for sure. So my name is Kjeld Hansen. I work at a university in, uh, in Oslo, in Norway and also affiliated with Copenhagen Business School, where I work on digitalization issues. But uh, the reason that I got invited to this panel is because I chair an organization that is called the European Lung Foundation, and that uh, works in, in collaboration with the European Respiratory Society. So it's within Lung Health, European Respiratory Society, that represents 30,000 uh, healthcare professionals within the respiratory space. And the European Lung Foundation then represents the, the patient voice and the interaction between the European Respiratory Society and the outside world, so to speak. So we have more than 400 volunteers working with us. We have offices in, uh, in Sheffield in the UK and in Brussels in Belgium. Thank you so much, Kjeld, for, for joining us today. And it's really impressive what you do with uh, patients and uh, physicians. Uh, next, we have Diana von Stein, MD, PhD. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Diana uh, and I am a resident in pediatrics in the Netherlands. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Lapsy Health, not Lepsy Health, <laughs> but that's a minor detail. Um, and I'm also the chief medical officer from, uh, from the company where we actually are digitalizing uh, sound. Um, and uh, working in pediatrics, I think in the previous panel, whoever already uh, was there, um, has been discussed of the potential of, of uh, having digital health in pediatrics and what kind of impact it has, and especially talking about the digital therapeutics, I think it has a very big space, and I would love to talk uh, and share my ideas about that. Um, and I think we also have a big space within our company of Lapsy Health, uh, as I'm the chief medical officer, to direct it towards that direction um, to make a very big impact uh, in children's health. Thank you very much, Diana. And uh, next we have Steve. Is it roast or roost? Roost. Well, in Dutch it's roast. In du in bit, like yes, in English, we're Dutch. It's, we're like, Dutch. it's like roost, what chickens do, you know? Ah, we're, we're Dutch. I, I speak Dutch. Oh, so okay. Steve well, roost. That makes one of us. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Steve Roost. I'm the founder, co founder, and CEO of PocDoc. We have developed a smartphone based blood test, quantitative blood test that can be done by a smartphone app. Our first one is a five marker lipid panel. So I suspect that the reason that I'm on the panel is that we are developing kind of like a, an interface or using digital technologies to allow people to enter cardiovascular disease therapeutic pathways via point of care testing. Um, so I think it's, you know, it depends a bit about how you sort of term digital therapeutics, but it's certainly a digital solution that enables access to therapeutics that otherwise would be. Uh, well, it's actually a huge block. So look, it's great to be on here, and, and I'm super excited about this whole area. So in my previous keynote that I did earlier, I threw out a bit of a stat bomb that digital therapeutics is growing at like 26% year on year and scheduled to do so till 2030, so, which is kind of impressive. So yeah, great to be here with such an esteemed panel with so many letters after their names. I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we have Mattia Pirani. Uh, you're from Italy, I guess? Yes, yes, I'm from Italy. And hello, everybody. My name is, is Mattia, and as you can see, I have an exercise, physiology, and sports science background. And during my studies, again in the Netherlands, um, I came across this topic very, very interestingly. And I came across also this platform, which is called Pink Trainer, that uh, I really wanted to use because uh, as an exercise, especially I follow patients during their cancer uh, trajectory, uh, during uh, treatment, after treatment, etc. And thanks to this platform, I thought I could follow much, much more uh, patients, gather very nice data, etc. So I decided to um, translate it and implement it in Italy and in Europe in different languages. So yeah, that's basically what I do now for them. Mattia. So we'll start the panel, I guess, with uh, conceptualizing a little bit digital therapeutics uh, for the ones that don't know. Uh, maybe I could just ask this question to the public. Uh, how many of you know what digital therapeutics are? Raise your hands. Okay, half of the panel. So let's uh, see, uh, Diana, <clears throat> let's start with you. Um, can you maybe give us a little bit of an insight on, into digital therapeutics? 
Yeah, I think mm -hmm. how I would love to um, explain it is in the way of the traditional medicine is mainly if you have a patient that you're diagnosing with a disease, you treat it with the medication. And then you actually give some lifestyle advices, but there's not much room for helping in, in, in that uh, aspect of treating the disease, which is actually a very big part of the disease and also in how you cope with your disease. So I think the digital therapeutics is a, like a digital pill. Like you can actually um, modify the lifestyle around uh, the di chronic diseases. That's why I think it has such a, such a big impact in chronic diseases by helping changing lifestyle or also the coping mechanism and uh, recognition of the disease. And I think that is exactly, exactly what uh, digital therapeutics is. Yes, thank you so much, Diana. So these interventions that are digital, um, Kiel, let's, let's start with you. Um, let's talk about the applications in, in lung uh, health. Yeah, so it's, it's one of the areas that we work with a lot because uh, one of the big problems within lung health is the lack of ad adherence when, they, when taking medicines. So most people, even though they're instructed to, to take the medicines in the wrong way, we think that digital therapeutics or uh, therapeutics that can help patients in directing them uh, towards uh, doing it in a, in a better way. Um, I think it's also, especially during the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of uh, our patients through, uh, through digital devices and so on, both when we had uh, conversations or when they were talking to their doctors and so on. You understand more about what goes on in the home and it's more legitimate to to talk about what are you doing in your own space. And that's also where I think uh, something like digital uh, therapeutics can, can help you to, uh, to engage with both your doctors and your own habits, your own life. And I think uh, quite often it's trivial uh, reasons why people don't adhere to the medication or don't uh, behave in a, in a responsible way towards the disease. And that's something we can do something about now. Yes, just like you guys said, behavioral is super important. Now, we, we are seeing more and more people using smartphones. Uh, you know, digital literacy continues to increase. And um, one of the things that we can see is that uh, because of the usage of smartphones, then we can actually deliver healthcare easier and faster to patients, especially the ones that have lacking on mobility. So, tel you know, digital therapeutics related to rehabilitation might be probably the next step, right? So, Matia, tell us a little bit about movement and rehabilitation with digital therapeutics. Absolutely on point because uh, this was my reason of uh, starting to implement this platform because like this you can follow and prescribe uh, interventions uh, like uh, exercise but also uh, nutritional, cognitive behavioral therapy etc to a much much more uh, extent of people and uh, it's very important because uh, the centers, for example, medical centers or uh, f uh, physiotherapy center that does, for example, cancer rehabilitation. In the Netherlands, there are some. In Italy, very few. And so uh, this is not uh, accessible at all. And thanks to, the, to these um, the, uh, applications and digital therapeutics, everybody can have their uh, lifestyle intervention on point, focused changing towards the goal, for example, of the patient on, uh, for example, uh, during chemotherapy, it would be a completely different exercise plan than you have after, for example, and uh, it has to be like that because, and for example, it's very different to the normal fitness app that uh, we are used to, for example, do eight minutes of uh, like uh, six pack in eight minutes. It's completely not that, you know, and uh, Luckily, these kind of devices are uh, connecting more and more people. That's excellent. Um, that's excellent. So I indeed, what, what you say is very important because you can really like reach those people. And probably the people that need rehabilitation are less movable, right? So they can't really uh, access those centers. So actually, you're really reaching the right people that actually need that rehab. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you know, how do we actually make decisions <coughs> When we talk about digital therapeutics, we need some data that is uh, the one that tells us when a decision has to be made, which intervention has to be made. In this case, and I would, go, I would like to go to Steve now, uh, you guys are actually creating that data and making it accessible yeah. so we can actually deliver digital therapeutics. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, I think our view on the situation would be that, that or one of the areas that we've really 
sort of noticed as a major block is that sort of inverted, if you like. So if people are interacting through a digital healthcare service, but then they need to get punted back into the old physical healthcare service to, in order to have a diagnostic done, that creates a huge amount of friction and block and potentially delay to treatment. So we've obviously focused on trying to digitize, if you like, that diagnostic step. Um, my interest or one of the interesting areas I'd like to get the panel's thoughts on is like, at what point does a therapeutic or what point does a companion become a therapeutic, right? So like a therapeutic is something that can be prescribed in the place of, you know, like Diana said, in the place of a pharmaceutical intervention. Right? So I think that that's a really interesting kind of interplay and when that sort of crosses over into something that can actually like be prescribed because it has equivalent or slightly better, or a lot better um, sort of value to the patient. So I don't know, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so I think also digital therapeutics, it, uh, in, it encapsulates a degree of collaboration also. I think it's more than self-management, but it's also something that uh, includes the lived experiences and uh, what, kind of, um, what kind of trends that you see also in patient communities uh, coming along. So I just want to give an example from our own organization. So uh, our resp respiratory society, also developed uh, treatment guidelines. And indeed, gu these guidelines now, they're also including patients in order to uh, develop that perspective in the guidelines. And that, uh, that means that there's a lot of corrections to the medical point of view in order to allow more patients to participate in that. And I think that's also one of the ways that we need to, uh, to think about digital therapeutics that not only collaborate with the patients who is being treated, but also um, involving them on other levels of the, of the treatment paradigm. I think what you both just said is like super important and probably is amazing for the next question. Because yes, prescribability, what you said, it's completely true. There are some attempts already to classify prescribabilities by the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, for instance. And if you don't know, you can Google that. And then what you said, you know, guidelines, super important. So let's, oh, Diana, do you want to say something? add to that because I think there is like a whole area right because if you look which is not my comfort zone like diabetes type 2 because that's more older diseases not the pediatrics where I'm in but if you actually have the right, right um, lifestyle advices and you have the right uh, coping mechanism you can actually uh, prevent yourself from using a specific medication um, you but it as well. Sorry? You can reverse it as well. Yeah, exactly. So you, you can actually replace the, the, the pharmaceutical therapy. But if you're thinking more about the pediatrics where you have, let's say, asthma, you can teach children to recognize their symptoms better. You can, uh, so they can take their medication earlier. They can learn how to cope with their diseases better. And these children are actually the ones that are missing school because they're getting sick and get admitted to, to the hospital. They are the ones that eventually are not gonna be able to go and uh, have a higher education because they miss so much on school. They are the ones where the parents actually have to stay home for the kids that are missing, missing work. Mm -hmm. So this has eventually such a massive impact and there it goes hand in hand. So you're not replacing the treatment with the medication, but you're actually making a better cooperation. Um, so I think you have a whole area in digital therapeutics. It's not just replacement. It's mm -hmm. not just a, a buddy that yeah. is going along with you in your chronic disease. It has a whole, depending on the disease, it has a whole spectrum of what it could uh, mean. Yeah, I think that's important. because I think that what you would want to avoid is, I guess, regulating something out of existence that could actually help right, because you require it to be prescribable, but it can't get to that level for whatever reason, they're just regulatory or clinical guidance or whatever, but actually, like in that instance, although they're not giving up the asthma inhaler or the actual pharmaceutical, but actually there's a, something that's more than a buddy, less than a, actually something that's prescribable that's net positive, right? We, we have also Kiel, that you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that because I think it's a very interesting perspective. I know from, Many discussions with patients that are afraid that digital solutions will replace the physical contact. Yeah. But when you formulate it as you both did right, then I think it's not a dangerous proposition. And then I just wanted to add, because I know also the WHO is working now uh, for the first time, I think in 25 years, they're updating their therapeutic patient education guidelines. And that's another perspective, right? We also need to educate patients and children or parents of children, right, to engage with these new technologies in order to make it work. Yeah. Now, if we, if we talk about prescribable therapeutics, and probably we're going to be reaching the end of the panel, so I'm just going to really quickly ask this because it's super important. Um, 
a physician is not just going to prescribe something just because it just came out of the market. So we need to do a lot of clinical validation. So Diana, um, can you tell us a little bit about validation in terms of digital therapeutics? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point that you're addressing because uh, I don't think we just have to address the patient population. We have to take the doctors with us to really make this a solution that everybody is confident in prescribing but also using. Um, and I think the movement that we're seeing right now, it was a big hype also, the d digital therapeutics, especially in, in the mental health space. Mm. Uh, but if you're looking actually at the percentage that was clinically validated, it was very low. I think it was up to 6%. And that is where you're missing the boat uh, with the physicians because we're academic. We are trained that everything needs to be proven. Otherwise, we're not going to prescribe it. We're not going to suggest something to a patient that they can use it, but not really knowing if it is going to, in the end, is going to make a difference, if they're going to feel better, yes or no. We need it to be proven. So I think that to, to incorporate into the digital therapeutic is the patient, but also the doctor. The doctor needs to be taken into this as well. Um, um, and to have it proven that it actually works. So it would be a, a really a collaboration. Steve. Yeah, I think as you're saying, building on that, I think, which I, th I completely agree with, I think the, um, there's also a regulatory framework aspect here as well, which is really important. So clinical validation or clinical data exists generally if something's going to be regulated within the larger framework, whether it's regulated as a drug or regulated as a medical device or regulated as something. There's some kind of approval for use based on an intended target, an intended audience, a performance. Obviously, we're, we're clearly a medical device. We're a diagnostic. So I think that how that interplays with, you know, particularly your point, Diana around those mental health apps, some of which are on the softer end of the scale, right? So like, I think that that's going to be quite interesting as to what regulatory framework these people have to navigate through, what's acceptable. And so I don't know what the panel feels about the, the German digger, you know, the DIGA thing. I don't know if you were going to come onto that, but that's created a framework. And then the other piece around it is obviously what's reimbursable. Well, who gets paid? How do they get paid? Yes, so we're not going to have time to talk about that <laughs> because we have two minutes left. But everyone that wants to, that wants to, you know, link with them, I mean, Diga, yes. Do you, do you want us to talk about Diga? I don't know, it's your panel. You talk about what you want. Diga, the Diga is an amazing, an amazing opportunity, and I think it's going to be really leveraging a lot when Germany also gets uh, digitized to the level of Diga's, you know, uh, structure. And regarding reimbursement, it's very different in every single country in Europe. So unless we're going to be able to navigate the reimbursement uh, opportunities in each country, you know, and be able to see mark an MD, especially with a new MDR regulation, it's going to be very tough. <laughs> Just really quickly, let's give some messages to the public. Um, I would love to finalize the panel with like, great messages. And I think, Mattia, what you're doing with uh, uh, movement science and rehabilitation is amazing, and we know it's going to work. Please, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, my message would be that those interventions, especially with digital health, that uh, can even spread even more these uh, in interventions to patients that are super effective, I've seen really... Uh, really some uh, super things on patient that uh, they could change the, change indeed the, the life how they can uh, get back into society into uh, daily life etc and those uh, things should be integrated much much more uh, for example in my topic in cancer center or patient association as well play a big interplay in offering some services to the patient that the national service cannot uh, integrate to. So uh, digital health is just an opportunity to spread even more those services because patient needs them and in the oncology world, more, uh, most of the time is just uh, take this treatment and you cope with the side effects. Thank you so much. Steve. Um, yeah, I'll keep it quick because we've got like 50 seconds. So I would say just a different take on it, which is if um, what can be delivered digitally to the same level or better than another treatment, we should keep our, we should, we should look at it. Like it should, there should be a process by which that's looked at. The flip side of that is if you're a developer of that or you're a manufacturer of that or you know, it, that's your company, you should be okay with people running due diligence on that and that there'd be a high level of clinical, you shouldn't get pissed off about that. Like that's just par, like that's table stakes for medical devices or farm, like you've got to play by the same rules that everyone else plays with just because you're an app developer. If you want to play in that market, if you don't, then that's different. Thank you so much. Diana. 
Yeah, I, I think I will repeat that I think the massive impact of digital therapeutics in the early life stages on the whole family and then not to forget to take the physician in, the, in your development um, with you so you can actually develop it together with the whole team so it will be embraced by everybody. Thank you so much. Kilt. Yeah, so uh, I will just repeat one of the points also made earlier. I think trust is the big issue uh, here, right? So if you're a patient and, and you're using digital therapeutics, then uh, I think uh, one of the main concerns is that you're not going the wrong way, you're going the right way in collaboration with your doctors and other suppliers. So thanks. Thank you so much, Kilt. Thank you to the entire panel. They have been more than amazing. Thank you to the public for attending today. And thank you for Three Bridges MNC. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye.